Thanks, Andy. So it's my uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the last um, the last panel for the for the day. I think, and, and Renee also asked me, so I won't I won't I won't let her down because she'll be mad at me to mention that there is a networking reception uh, next door uh, when we're done when we're done here. But the the last panel for the day is equity investing in a dynamic world, uh, which as a fixed income investor I'm uncomfortable introducing, but 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 that's okay. <laughs> Be, be that be that as it may <laughs> be that as it may um, uh, it's it is going to be moderated by finance professor Ronnie Sotka. let me Ronnie will introduce the panelists uh, but let me uh, introduce Ronnie Ronnie is the senior associate Dean of faculty uh, a professor and chairperson of the finance department in the Carroll School of Management his research focuses on liquidity and financial markets uh, more recently he has been developing big data driven investment applications Ronnie is a frequent speaker at academic and practitioner conferences. He works, his work has appeared in various outlets, including academic journals, mainstream media, uh, and trade publications. Uh, prior to joining the faculty here, Ronnie taught at Northwestern's Kellogg School, the University of Washington's Foster School, NYU's Stern School, and the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Uh, his industry experience includes quantitative strategies at Goldman Sachs, Asset Management, and Lehman Brothers. Uh, he uh, served as a member of the Economic Advisory Board for the NASDAQ, uh, and uh, Ronnie earned his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and a master of science in operations research from Tel Aviv University. He received his uh, AHIS PhD in finance from Northwestern University's uh, Kellogg School. I've gotten to know uh, Ronnie over the past uh, year or two, and it's always a pleasure to have a conversation with him. So with that, let me turn the, the, the microphone and the panel over to Ronnie. Thank you, Mark. Um, First of all, I think you forgot the most important thing about me. That your wife is French? <laughs> okay. I'll say that it's number two for now. But I'm also the Seidner Family Fellow. Oh, nice. That's the most important thing. So, so again, thank you, Mark. Thanks for everyone uh, for sticking around. This has been a fantastic uh, conference so far. I'm really, I mean, this is really fantastic. It's great. Um, <clears throat> Before I begin, though, I have to say, I mean, I have to answer your question. Because I took it kind of personally when you said, what is CSOM doing about it? Remember that question? <laughs> I have to answer it. Don't look at me. I got to answer this. I mean, <laughs> so I, I think, you know, we, we heard a lot about fintech and data analytics. And I think, you know, we understand that this is something very important and we're working on it. So we're constantly evaluating our curriculum. We have great, fantastic faculty that are already doing a lot of data analytics. And we're going to, we want people from, you know, CSOM to come out as the idea people. But I think they have to be, they have to have the tools that are going to help them, you know, in, in getting jobs and understanding how to deal with data in this new age. So we're, we're working on that, and you can hear more about, about that. All right, so let me start actually by introducing uh, our, our distinguished uh, panelists. Um, I have here uh, Steve Barry. Steve is the Chief Investment Officer of Fundamental Equity at Goldman Sachs, and you're an 85 graduate. I am. So I'm going to just do this quickly. I mean, you can read all this stuff, so let, let's just stay on time. I'll just uh, very short introductions. So thanks, thanks for uh, Thank you, coming back. Uh, we've got Vince um, Gubi Gubitosi, 94. Thanks for coming as well. Uh, President and Chief Investment Officer at uh, Geode Capital Management. And um, last, not least, uh, J. Paul Loop, um, Managing Director, Portfolio Manager at Lazard Asset Management. So, you know, as I was thinking about the questions that we're going to talk about here, we had a phone call before this. But uh, in the beginning, I was kind of, you know, why am I doing this like last session? Who wants to do last session? But at the end of the day, the, the topics we, we raised were very, um, you know, closely related to what we talked about all day. And I, I want to think about this as like a capstone kind of session. Because what we heard in the morning is there's a lot of political instability, right? There's a lot of um, political risk. If you think about what we had last year, remember Larry Summers? He was here last year. What happened since then, right? We had the Brexit, right? Then we had, you know, Macron was elected. <clears throat> Today we have, uh, you know, another election in the UK. There's constantly more and more political, um, insta well, political risk. Things are changing, and that might affect our our investment. And it's the case that, that more of our R squared of volatility is kind of determined by these, uh, by these events. So I think that's one thing we want to talk about in the spirit of disruptions or things that are changing rapidly in the dynamic world. Maybe that's one thing that we want to talk about 
is political risk. And we can talk about political general, I mean, global and domestic, domestic in, in so far as maybe, you know, what's going to happen to our investments if we reduce taxes, what's going to happen when we, we deregulate Wall Street, so we can talk about that. I think the second topic should be related to this kind of fintech idea that we talked about. And I really like Jeb Bush's, um, Governor Bush's um, example about, um, about UPS. And, you know, does this mean, what do I take from that example? Does that mean that in these kind of long UPS or FedEx and short trucks, because there's less trucks now, you know? So what does it mean from an investment standpoint? I want this session to be more about, you know, what do we do with the information that we learned in the first, uh, you know, the first, in, in most of the day. And the third, I think we should talk about if, um, if we are getting to a situation where we have more information, the market is becoming more efficient, what does that mean about our alpha, and what does it mean for fees? And I think a lot of us, I mean, I don't want this to become completely like, you know, we're kind of venting about the fees, but a lot of us in the industry are really feeling the heat about fees, and active versus passive, so we should, I think, talk about that as well. So that's in general, I think, the theme, and then we'll open up for questions. So let's start, I um, thought maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, uh, Jay. Sure. But talking about, a little bit about what do you think, I mean, you're more a fundamental guy, so just right. so people understand, you're kind of a fundamental uh, a guy, and it's, so is Steve, and, um, and Vince is more kind of a quant, quant person. I think all, of, it doesn't matter where you are in asset management, you're being affected by these, by these um, these, uh, I guess, shocks. Don't tell my team I became a quant. <laughs> <laughs> we can, yeah, you know, we, we talked about it. Quantumental, <laughs> quantumental. All right, so, Jay, what do you think about, you know, how are we going to handle, you know, the political risk in terms of our investment portfolio? Well, I, I think the short answer is, and this is the approach we, we take, we have to manage through it. It's basically the game that we have to play. And uh, the area that we follow at Lazard Asset Management, we run 340 Act uh, mutual funds open-ended. Um, most of you know what those are, but basically they're open on open platforms and are load waived. Uh, we invest um, uh, using the fund, the Lazard Global Realty Fund, the Lazard U.S. Realty Fund, and the Lazard uh, U.S. Realty Income Fund. And so we're investing globally, and we're investing in a in multiple markets where political events and ramifications are are, are being felt. Um, the U.S. election, obviously, uh, when um, Donald Trump was uh, elected, uh, unexpectedly. Uh, you recall that a lot of his campaign, he campaigned about uh, the economic relationships that we had with places like China and Mexico. Well, in our space, we're invested in both China and Mexico in our, in our global fund. We buy real estate investment trusts and operating companies that own real assets. So they own industrial buildings, malls, office buildings, hotels, essentially anything attached to the ground. Uh, you saw over a 20% sell-off in our space in both Mexico uh, and, and in China uh, post-election. And again, we're fundamentally oriented. And really, our macro analysis was, yeah, you talk tough on the campaign like a lot of politicians do. He just did it a little differently. But the reality is, is that the US is, is the largest or one of the largest trading partners of both of those nations. Even if trade relations are renegotiated, which they will be over time, no country will ever do uh, cut a deal that's not in its own best interest. So the terms may change a bit. We think they'll change less than what has been advertised. And then ultimately, that uh, both whoever we trade with, whether it's China, Mexico, or other countries, will go back to normalize trade relations over time. So uh, our reaction was, once we did our macro research, to look for value in both of those countries. And, and we did increase allocations of both Mexico and China. And, and the ideas, thankfully, have started to work. Not every idea works, obviously, as we'll get into. But um, we, our reaction to and our response to a changing political environment was essentially getting really back down to the fundamentals and trying to do them e even better. Uh, the other area that affected our space um, right after uh, another unexpected uh, ballot count was the Brexit exit. Uh, and the prop listed property companies the London-based companies traded off, again, well over 20%, some as much as 30%. And going back to, again, the fundamental approach we take, London is a universal financial investment destination for sovereign funds, high net worth individuals, other countries, pension funds. We really didn't see that changing as an investment destination. Trade relations between uh, the UK and Europe would, are obviously going to change. Uh, but the fact that, that London being a, a destination for I investors, particularly high quality real estate investors, we felt wouldn't change. And again, that was another instance where we, um, 
where we, we increased an allocation and it's starting to work, although we had an election today, I haven't seen the results yet, so we, we could have been wrong. Um, but I, I think the, the short answer and the summary answer is really doing better fundamental work, but also incorporating macro analysis more heavily into the way we approach our stock picking and portfolio management. Very good. And uh, so maybe, Steve, do you want to take a? Sure, Ronnie. Uh, I share a lot of the sentiments that Jay just shared. Uh, one of the things that uh, I would observe that elections in particular are something that the market can anticipate, can have some anticipation dynamic around them. There's a date, there's a lot of polling, there's, uh, there's uh, preparatory kind of information that comes out. And so the market, no matter how efficient it has become, or maybe because it is efficient, it's a discounting mechanism. And I think one of the things that's been most important to understand, no matter what you're doing in the investment uh, arena today, is to understand where the bets are out there in the marketplace. And the price of being right, it may have already gotten paid to be right. And then the price of being wrong. And so the, the, the vehicles out there, the tools, how people hedge, uh, and when events happen, uh, the, 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 re, the rebalancing with now a known, and a known outcome uh, creates a lot of this volatility. And so we would observe that uh, when it was the, I believe it was the Italian referendum, it took about a couple months mm -hmm. for it to get discounted into the market, for the market to, under, to understand it. It took Brexit two days to get into the market and readjusted. And it took the U.S. election two hours, at least the beginning of it. Right, in that the, those of us who were watching that election uh, and watching what was going on in Japan, as it looked appear, uh, that, that Trump was going to win, markets were down five, six percent. And then by the time the markets opened in the US, we were back to flat and began a, a, a rally. So it's, it's a really interesting time to be an investor because the information or the data is coming at you rapid, rapid uh, uh, speed, but there's still an art and a need to interpret it correctly and to have, a, and have a, uh, a time horizon from which you can, you can uh, implement that. And you know, the hedging needs to get done. As, as Jay said, you know, that's, this is the world we're in. Clients have expectations. But um, a lot of work gets done beforehand. You got to prep for the fire drill uh, and, then, uh, and then take the, the facts as they, uh, as, they, as they play through. And the real, I think the real advantage is to make sure that you can invest with conviction you know, around a t around a time horizon and an alignment with a client uh, a client interest, no matter what asset class it is, whether it's real estate, whether it's fixed income, whether it's equities, or anything else in between, the, that time horizon is critical. Very good. So let, let's talk a little bit. I th when when we had our, our call, I thought it was very interesting when we talked about the taxes, because my I, I didn't really uh, appreciate what a change in tax would do. I thought, well, you know, just the taxes, you know, I think it's a good thing, okay, overall. But, um, but for example, when you're dealing with REITs, right. it has a significant and unique impact on, on that business. Do you want, right. do you want to talk sure. about that? It, it, the, it's a good question for our space, and it's one that we're, we're highly attuned to. So the Real Estate Investment Trust, as many of you are familiar with, was actually created in 1960. It was one of the last pieces of legislation that President, President Eisenhower signed before leaving office and before President Kennedy took office. And the whole idea behind the Real Estate Investment Trust was to uh, bring um, institutional class real estate assets to Main Street. So the ability to own one or two shares of the Hancock or the Prudential Tower, which are owned by a publicly traded uh, real estate investment trust. And to, in order to do that, uh, a company has to elect to pay out 90% of its tax, taxable income in the form of dividends, so they're higher dividend stocks. And for that, the company declares REIT status and does not pay taxes at the corporate level. It's what's known as a pass-through enterprise. So the individual that is receiving the dividends pays taxes on those, and that's how the um, Internal Revenue Service collects revenue there. Well, when you talk about tax reform, and some of the things even that um, Jeb Bush talked about, the initial expensing of, of, of investment, which is an immediate tax deduction, that obviously has the effect of eliminating taxable income in the year that an investment uh, would, would be made. Uh, in effect, that could mean, if it was implemented and applied to the REIT space, that a REIT could make some big investments in a year and while they still had record earnings, wouldn't pay any income taxes. Now, we're not lobbying for that. Actually, the sector is actually lobbying against that because we think 
for fundamental reasons, it will encourage the building of a lot of new supply that is not needed and, and ruin the markets in, in many places. But there are, um, there are proposals uh, being talked about in ways and means that would potentially cha change the REIT structure. And that's something that we, again, have to really work through and invest through. And so we're monitoring it. We don't see it happening. Obviously, the um, uh, tax reform uh, plans that have been forwarded so far, are, none have been really moved on yet, at least not in the House where they need to begin. Um, but it does definitely have a ramification on, on, on our space. Great. Vince, what do you think about the deregulation? So you know, maybe I could go back to the last question just sure. for a moment to differentiate a bit how quantitative investors think about political risk versus um, fundamental investors. And, and as a um, long only quantitative equity investor, um, Steve pointed out that an election date is known. Well, for our models, we don't put the election date into our models. So our models are, are in a lot of ways blind to these events that are forthcoming in, 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 the, uh, in the political environment which, um, you know, on one hand, eliminates the behavioral bias that comes out of trying to interpret what's going to happen in front of those political events. Um, so what we do, and I think most quantitative investors do, is really focus on the risk ahead of those events, not necessarily trying to pick the winners and losers, but anticipating that risk is coming down the pike and potentially reducing risk, um, and also taking cues from the market. So many quantitative investors use uh, trend following or momentum type signals, which in essence is trying to learn from the behaviors of fundamental investors like these guys and what they're doing in the marketplace to try to um, get behind uh, some of the sentiment that, uh, that they have. So it's a slightly different approach um, to investing or a very different approach to investing, uh, which eliminates some behavioral biases, maybe introduces some others. Um, I would say for quantitative investors, Events like the election, inflection points in the markets, are typically difficult to navigate, um, partially because the models don't anticipate them and don't really uh, understand that a, a regime may have changed. Um, I would say in, in our case, um, the Trump trade, as it's called, it was something that our models picked up. And partially because of the momentum that was in the market from guys like this, who, who saw that there was some maybe infrastructure or tax uh, legislation that was coming down the pike that would benefit certain sectors. Um, so a different way of uh, capitalizing on, on some of those same ideas uh, without potentially putting in some of the behavioral biases like you know, falling in love with the winners or selling the losers too quickly. You know, one thing I wanted to add, because I don't want to leave anyone with the right impression that we called or made all, just only good moves post-election. We got two things fundamentally wrong uh, pre-election. Um, we didn't anticipate Donald Trump winning, and uh, we were under-allocated to the hotel space. And if you followed the election, uh, there was a real Trump rally in hotels uh, at post-election, 20% from election day to the, to the end of the year. Uh, the fundamentals, again, were fundamental first investments, supply, demand, and, and uh, RevPAR growth, revenue per available room growth uh, stats that we had really didn't justify that kind of price movement. Uh, so we didn't chase it, but we, we certainly missed it. Uh, the stocks have been coming back to earth this year, but that one hurt us at year end. It wiped out a, a big gain that we had uh, on the benchmark. The other was a, a, just a smaller story. If you recall, in the late uh, waning months of the Obama administration and also uh, the Clinton campaign talked about, there's a there's a, there are two REITs in the United States that actually own prison buildings. Uh, one operates and the other just owns the buildings and leases them to the government and the government runs the prisons. But basically it's a financing form for governance, gover governments to save money uh, in the way they own their assets. Uh, there was an active movement on the part of the Justice Department under the Obama administration and then also that the, the Clinton campaign picked up on that those facilities would all be closed uh, post uh, inauguration of President uh, Clinton. When uh, so we just wanted to get out of the way of that, and uh, we did, uh, and those stocks rallied 50 percent uh, post-election. So that one hurt us too. So, you know, you don't always get it right. We try not to handicap the, the elections, but we try to be uh, again fundamentally oriented and nimble once we have the facts in front of us. So, in terms of regulatory, I, I would say um, less so about the way we invest and more so about the way we manage our business. Uh, the regulatory environment over the past decade, I would say, has become increasingly onerous. Um, and you know, that, you know, I think it's evidenced in some of the Dodd-Frank um, rules as well as uh, more recently the DOL rules. Um, I would say that sort of dovetails a bit with the political environment. And, and I, I think all of us uh, with the new administration initially um, expected that the 
at least the pace of new regulations was going to slow. And I think that has rung true. Um, I think right now there's just increasingly uncertainty as what will happen with um, existing regulations and whether or not they get changed. And, and you know, my personal view on it is it's very difficult to, to change the rules that are already in the books. Um, however, I do think it is promising that the current administration appears to be a bit more business friendly, especially to financials, asset managers, and banks um, as a whole, and expect that to um, um, make our operating environment easier and hopefully leading to better products for um, um, end consumers. Yeah, we, we, just on the, de the uh, deregulatory kind of sentiment that's going on out there, you know, we, we'd observe that uh, as, as Vince just shared, if, it's, if a rule's in place, that's certainly uh, going to be more difficult because you'll need, you'll need Congress and a variety of things to change. But the interpretation of rules, there are so many dynamics in, within Dodd-Frank and Volcker and all these other uh, very large, all-encompassing kind of de deregulatory um, um, frameworks that is the interpretation of them that's often uh, left to the, the regulator himself how, or herself, how they, how they want to uh, enforce them. And so some clarity on that and, a, and, and an easing on, that, uh, on the intensity and, and, a, and a better understanding and partnership and discussions that were really lacking uh, in some previous uh, time, you know, backward looking, should allow at least business to get done. And so that's, that might be the one component of the Trump trade that feels like it remains uh, uh, alive and the market will ebb and flow on how it wants to uh, embrace that or not. Some of the other things certainly uh, have run into uh, uh, the proverbial Washington uh, buzzsaw. So. One of the things uh, just in, in regulation and scrutiny it really is up and down the line in, in our industry and all of the vehicles that we manage. But if you watch the venture panel earlier in the day, Worley started talking about, and then he corrected himself, uh, he was going to talk about a company, and he, then he said, look, I've had Goldman Sachs compliance training now, and now I can't mention any companies because I can't be seen as promoting them. Uh, we're subject to the same restrictions at Lazard, so I'm wondering if they talk to each other. But uh, it used to be when we do panels like this, all the managers would come up here and talk about our favorite stock ideas, which was very, very uh, usual. It would be like a Barron's article, my top three to stock picks are this, and this is why. We're not allowed to do that anymore. It's seen as promoting a particular stock, even though it's in our public filings. We own it. We obviously like the stock, or we wouldn't be talking about it. But we—that's uh, another just you know smaller item that, that we just can't do anymore. Oh, I'm glad because I didn't like those uh, those panels. Anyway. <laughs> 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 can already tell you, markets going up 10 percent, fixing going up 10 percent. Right. We know it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, about technology because. I thought to, er, earlier today, I thought it was very interesting, some of the things that are going on in fintech. But even, even not, you know, fintechs, before we get to, to fintechs, the, the evolution you know, in technology, what we see today, and we talk about, you know, about the consumers, for example, right? I mean, people don't go to the shops anymore, right? I mean, for those of you who've, who've been watching the retail market uh, uh, in the past, uh, you know, this, this past earnings season, I mean, a lot of them are down, right? I mean, people don't go to shop in Macy's anymore. We shop, you know, online, shop on our phones. And I think as an asset manager, you want to think, you know, what's the opportunity now? So I think, you know, are you, are you going to invest in firms that are kind of more technology-oriented? Are you going to start looking at, you know, measures of instead of foot traffic, you know, web traffic? And I think it, it really, you know, affects uh, some of the assets that you're holding. Sure. I think that, that's interesting. I think technology affects how the asset management world is, is conducting business, or not conducting business, um, the process of investment is different. There's you know, high frequency trading, there's more technology in the trading, and we should talk about that. And, and then also there's technology in the sense of bringing new data to the table, and how we, extra, you know, how we extract alpha from technology driven, technology uh, driven um, I guess, uh, signals. So maybe, you know, Vince, do you wanna, you wanna start Sure. As, as a quantitative investor, we've always relied heavily on technology and data. And I would say over the past several years, the availability of data has, has exploded. Um, and the opportunities to store that data, interpret that data, um, have, have uh, been advanced significantly. Um, so when we think about where we're going to invest in the future in terms of R&D at Geode, it's about AI. Um, and collecting additional uh, sources of data, structured and unstructured, 
um, and the speed at which we can um, consume that data, analyze that data, and implement it within our uh, investment strategy. So for us, it's been an evolution. Um, I would say it's not, doesn't come without its risks. We talked a little bit about cybersecurity in, in the last um, panel. Um, and, and that's a, a growing concern of ours, um, both for the firm as well as the system. Um, so that's an area where, you know, again, it sort of combines with regulatory to some extent as well. We're seeing regulators uh, increasingly focus on cybersecurity and we as a firm increasingly investing in, in, in cybersecurity. Um, there's also, I think, uh, in the technology war in investment management, some, <laughs> some real winners and, 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 and losers. And I would say on the high frequency side, that's certainly been our experience that there are um, uh, few firms who have the resources and the focus to invest in technology and systems uh, to the point where a firm like ours, who's not solely focused on high frequency trading, uh, cannot compete in that space. So in some ways, I think of it as an arms race. Um, and some of the bigger players have essentially won that arms race. Um, so I think uh, that will continue. And, and, and you know, high frequency trading is just one example of a place where um, for those who invest heavily in technology, they will leave others, others behind. I'd say at, at, at Goldman we have one of our, our core advantages or maybe even cultural is a, a collaborative environment. And what we've, what we've learned over the course of the last five or six years is that we're better accepting and learning from each other uh, some of the biases that may be in, uh, implicit in, in, our, uh, in, a, in a fundamental basis, some of the things that go on in a quantitative uh, modeling world. And you know, to, to empower our people with, with tools that try to remove biases, that help them think about risks, expose risks. For, and so there really is, when, I, when you introduced me as a quant earlier in, in, in jest, um, there is this, this uh, uh, movement toward, you know, stock picking remains uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a valuable uh, art or function, but you, you have to evolve with how the marketplaces are, uh, are, are gathering that information, the freshness of the information, the still into building models on cash flows and, and, and watching balance sheets evolve and earning statements, but the inputs, and then ultimately how you build better portfolios around exposing risks, being aware of, of, of factor risks rather than just business continuity risks that, are go, that go on in, when we typically thought about risk as a fundamentalist. So that, that, that hybrid uh, way, a collaborative organization dedicated to, to, to technology, um, trying to hire the best and the brightest, come to the table with an, accept, an, a, an open mind to that there are new ways of doing some old things, I think uh, is good for, good for all, all investing, but that's how we've been trying to, to leverage technology, think about risk. We do it across equities, fixed income, and quantitative and fundamental ways, and it's a way that uh, we think over time, it doesn't have to be neither or. It's, uh, it's truly how everything is, is evolving. So big data, but data in and of itself, you have to be able to interpret it. So data that becomes information, that becomes knowledge, that becomes wisdom ultimately, to paraphrase T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot. That's kind of where we think investing, investing is going. I think it's a really good point. One thing I'd add to that is that um, uh, I think a successful quantitative investor is not simply mining data for something that has worked in the past. Some have tried that, it typically doesn't work in the future. So much of what we do when we build our models is try to emulate these guys and try to build a model that's hypothesis based um, and really put the, the um, IP that, that these fundamental investors have into code so that we can potentially more efficiently, not with the same level of certainty, uh, but more efficiently select winners over losers. So I, I think that the, the two approaches are coming together. Quant fundamental investors are very much starting to use more quantitative tools, and quantitative investors who are successful are trying to think about investing as a fundamental investor would, simply using different tools to get there. I think the, the, the topic in our space, because technology has affected us both uh, in the investment process as well as um, the success and failure of the companies that we invest in. Many of you are familiar with the ongoing topic of online retailers like Amazon. Uh, if they're going to totally eliminate the brick and mortar retailer, particularly uh, the fashion retailer, 
Um, and now, now more recently, the, the, the grocery uh, retailer as well. Well, that has real implications for the real estate investment trust space since about 20% of the equity market capitalization of our space is malls and, and shopping centers. Some very long, uh, long run companies that have had a terrific run and are, have experienced a lot of success but are, are facing a lot more in the way of challenges. Tenant bankruptcies are a reality uh, for retail landlords. They've been happening for the last 100 years. And the typical move by a landlord would be to get back space that was leased for a very long period of time at a very low rent, reposition the space, upgrade it, and then rent it at a higher rent to a new and improved retailer that basically takes over the same space. Well, that game has completely changed. And, and now uh, the better mall operators are essentially repositioning their malls. In some cases, they're knocking down big boxes when uh, a large retailer like a Sears or JCPenney um, exits, and they're building something different, whether it be uh, theaters, aquariums, something that brings uh, shoppers into a mall. Others are, uh, are, are moving to a, f a larger food uh, sale model where they're having essentially the European version of a food hypermarket uh, at one end of their mall. Uh, typically, the typical European mall is about 20% grocery, uh, about 18 to 20% entertainment, and then the, the remaining 60%, one anchor tenant, maybe two, and then inline retailers. The US mall has typically been about 40 to 50% department stores, and the rest inline retailers with very little food at all. That's changing dramatically, and it, we, we expect that to continue to change. In terms of how we look at online retailing and how, to how it will ultimately affect the retail landlord, uh, we do not believe that the mall is dead, but the Class A malls will continue to, to modify and prosper. But the B and C locations are going to probably become alternative uses at some point, either residential, office, uh, parks, uh, lodging, some other kind of use where, uh, where the business in that market has completely changed and, and evolved to. Very good. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, about the alpha space. I mean, we're talking about information, more information coming out. Data, not information. You like to say it, right? Okay, so it, more data coming out. It's coming out faster. Presumably, when you have more data, you get better information. The markets will become more efficient. Well, if the markets are more efficient, then why are we paying, you know, so many fees, right? So they're going to be obviously pressure on the fees. So I think the industry has coped with it in several ways. I mean, then, you know, we invented, I guess, this thing called, uh, you know, risk premium, smart beta. There's all these kind of buzzwords, try to get more fees. But overall, there seems to be more, more pressure because maybe there's more, you know, lack of opportunity. So do you think this is the case? Is there more, you think alpha is kind of dropping? There's more opportunities in the market? Let's we'll start with you, Steve. So a really easy question, right? <laughs> um, I think it's very important to look at the ability to create alpha uh, as a function also of the environment, not just the fact that there is a proliferation of data being created. And by that, I mean much of this uh, important groundswell toward more passive investing um, has been driven in a market, a post-crisis market in particular, one in which it was really all about getting beta in the market. I mean, markets uh, three times higher than it was in March of, of 09, something in that, in that range. Uh, and it has been a single dynamic market for much of that, all about monetary policy and, uh, and what, the, what that did to asset levels across every single asset. Uh, every risk asset, and even some that used to be riskless, uh, but all of them to get uh, to be repriced. So I am not dismissive that uh, the world has gotten more efficient uh, and that alpha is difficult to get, but I think the, lo looking at the most recent window of time backward uh, may lead you to, a, uh, to too strong a conclusion that it's, uh, it's all, the, all, all, all passive without any value and active. Uh, in fact, we're starting to see you know, more dispersions in the market, lower correlations in the market. And those are the, those are the fuel for active, for active management in, any, in credit, in, uh, in, in, in equities, in fixed in income, et cetera, in quantitative models for that matter. So um, 
Passive is here to stay. Uh, it's uh, there's spots where it, it is the better it is the better alternative. Fees are important, uh, particularly if returns become lower. We've had a, a very good run here of absolute returns. Uh, so if we get more return pressure, that beta is lower, that will also increase uh, the the issue around around a fee as a percent. But importantly, uh, if there really is alpha to be found, which I believe there is, lower absolute return environments I mean alpha is worth more on top of that. And so we're in this, we're in this tug of war. The data is very much in the friend, uh, in the camp of passive is the force to be reckoned with. And um, uh, DOL and all other things that are, are adding to that, flows of funds, ET, uh, all sorts of passive vehicles. It goes well beyond just the index fund. Mm -hmm. It goes into the sector ETFs. It goes into all of the things that people may want to express an opinion or get exposure and in an easy, quick way. Uh, but I, I do uh, believe and the markets are behaving differently, uh, partially because the monetary policy is changing and it is and it's manifesting itself in those, those correlation and dis um, dispersion changes that are, that are critical if you're going to create, uh, create alpha. So I don't want to write off alpha. It's going to be hard to get. You're going to have to invest in new methodologies, new tools, uh, remove biases from your process, understand risk management better than ever. But um, just because it's hard doesn't mean it won't, it won't be there. I'm confident that a lot of this was environmental and we're on the other side of that. So I, have a f uh, I think a few different things are at work here. So um, we at, at GEO have both an active and a passive business and so we can sort of see it from both angles. And, and a couple things I would say there is, um, one of the drivers is fees, um, and certainly when an investor is making an investment decision, fee is the only thing they know in advance, or one of the main things they know in advance. They don't, they don't know about performance in advance, so they're, they're tending to focus on fee over um, um, quality of product, I would say, um, or potential for alpha maybe is a better way of saying it. There was recently a, um, um, an article about the uh, I think it was. It showed the top ten, um, the the ten lowest uh, fee mutual funds active, uh, and they were all in inflow over the past several years. And then they showed the top ten performing mutual funds that were active, and they were all in out outflow. So it was clear that investors were choosing based on on fees over potential for performance. Um, I would say another dynamic is a move towards more uh, asset allocation type um, strategies. I think asset allocators um, are typically uh, think that the alpha that they're providing to their end customer is by market timing or asset class selection as opposed to stock selection within assets. So they've tended to move towards uh, passive vehicles as well because their view is that their alpha comes from, again, um, um, asset class selection. So I think that's been another dynamic that has moved uh, towards passive. It has an interesting impact on active managers because as uh, they try to compete, as we all try to compete by bringing <coughs> fees down, it gives us fewer resources to pursue that alpha. So you know, there may be at some point a, you know, a breaking point where um, active managers to compete need to bring their, their fees down so low that they can no longer invest in their business to find that alpha, which will, which will be an interesting dynamic. On the other side, however, um, there is a tipping point when the market is, is too passive. And the simplest way I can think about that is if S&P is choosing the weight of everyone's stock in, in their portfolio, that th there, there needs to be some mispricing there. Um, so I, I don't know where that tipping point is, uh, but it, it's pretty clear to me that if we get to 90% to passive, um, that 10% that that's left as being active will have a, a big opportunity to find alpha. You know, we found with the, the passive uh, form of investing in our space, it's, um, it, we're unclear how passive investors reward outperformance among individual companies and, and penalize underperformance. They tend to chase that uh, with their inflows and outflows. But we're feeling that same kind of pressure. The equity market capitalization of the real estate investment trust space is about a trillion dollars now. Uh, and about 16 to 18% of that is in uh, index funds. It's not unusual for some REITs to have their top two or three shareholders actually now be, be uh, in index funds, which 
Uh, Ten years ago, the index fund share of total equity market capitalization was less than a quarter of that, they, and they do run at lower fees. And so uh, it's definitely a competitive pressure um, in our space. Um, uh, just a couple thoughts there is we're doing more fundamental work. We always do a lot of fundamental work, but we're actually spending more time at the property level trying to gauge. I was in Salesforce Tower, uh, which is owned by a large U.S. REIT, which is uh, being topped out at the 61st floor in San Francisco uh, right now just to gauge the construction progress as well as leasing activity. And obviously, an index fund manager wouldn't be doing something like that. But that will help us determine you know, our opinion and the weighting uh, of our stock. That's just one small example. But the other th example that I want to give is that to counter that, one, we have to obviously continue to outperform. But two, we have to be nimble in the way we provide services to our investor clients. We're finding de much more demand for customized solutions in our space. We're a higher yielding sector, so we have actually some clients that come to us and strictly want a yield portfolio. Now, that's essentially impossible to find right now in index form. There may be some one or two out there that, that, that try to specialize that in our space, but we haven't seen it. And so there's demand there. Also concentrated portfolios, investors that want to have a sleeve that is active in our space, but maybe a, a 10 to 30 stock portfolio in a universe of, of about 200 publicly traded companies. So there are certain types of investors with certain types of demands that will have a role for our type of fundamental active investment, but the competitive pressures are certainly there from the in, in, uh, index funds. Very interesting. Well, at least, you know, Stevie Coin thinks that there's more Alpha to be made is coming back with 20 billion. So, wow. I guess uh, I guess the more we go passive, there's going to be more opportunity for the rest of us. I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, we have more time, but I think you know at this point. Let me. I think we covered a lot of what we wanted to cover. So we, we wanted to cover you know the changes in the political environment, domestic and global. We covered a little bit about the fintech and new information. Then you know we talked about the fees and passive is active. Maybe I think it's a good time to just open it up um, for the audience. I think when I, what I saw earlier on today is a lot of good questions and came from the audience. So you know we're here to kind of all discuss things that we think, you, you think um, that we think are important for you. So how about let's open it up and uh, let's see uh, any questions. Yes, please. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I think Dan uh, Holland started us off this morning by raising a question that there seems to have been a disconnect between uh, geopolitical volatility or activity and that of the capital markets. Like the capital markets are sailing along like there's no risk in the, uh, in the world. Um, but we never really got to an answer. Do you got, can you guys comment on that? It does seem like every day, like I feel like if North Korea launched a nuke to Los Angeles, the market would go up by 10%. Like, that's what it feels like today. So is there any comments you guys have on that? It, it seems to us like what you're st talking about in the US is certainly true, that, that uh, no matter how negative the news, the market may be off for a day or two, and it's not off by much. Um, uh, that it continues to trudge forward. And actually, you're seeing it. There was a good article in the Wall Street Journal a day or two ago that it's happening in pretty much all liquid asset classes right now. So that is a little bit of concern. It's on our risk meter right now. It's a little different globally in other parts of the world because we did, in fact, see major reactions to negative political events, um, uh, really more election-related. You really uh, didn't when there were horrible terrorist acts, you didn't really see a huge sell-off in any one country related to that, but really more geopolitical uh, events have been driving share prices in the very short term, and then, then the markets seem to work their way back to, to, to normal. But obviously, it's on our risk radar. Yeah, Dan, I'm going to say Dan's comments struck me as well as kind of spot on. And uh, lots of things that you know, we can talk about, complacency and disease and the VIX, and you know, just a, all of these things that, that light up as a very calm world, yet if you feel like they're tail risk, something that is not, anticip not anticipatory, or you can't, that you can't anticipate, um, could have a very, very dramatic effect. And there seems to be very little margin of safety in how assets are valued. Now, they're all valued versus each other fairly, but the base, the base rate or whatever is the starting point in your risk-free rate starts to set the prices for everything else. And so, I, I think one of the concerns I would have is that uh, while everyone, everyone is hoping for always a put little pullback so they can get, you know, get invested, when we get the pullback, there's always uh, the anxiety level all of a sudden shifts up. And there, because correlations are so high, we have gold up. You know, there was a, a very uh, timely article in the paper just the other day. Right? Gold, Bitcoin stocks, and yet treasuries 
or 220 on the 10 year. And so there's lots of, lots of mixed signals uh, going on out there. So I, I think, you know, um, buyer beware that uh, uh, if you are dismissive, that there are tail risks out there and don't make sure, you'll make sure that you have a portfolio that is diversified enough, different asset classes and some things that are uncorrelated, I think would be very important at this point. Yeah, I would just add so a few things. So one is um, we saw obviously a big rally after the election. We don't know what would have happened if the election would have gone the other way. But um, certainly we have seen uh, a, a big increase of flows into equity. So maybe a release of some animal spirits there as a result of uh, the removal of uncertainty over the election. Um, since that initial uh, rally, um, it's really been a low volatility environment. And um, I think investors, it seems, and this may be fitting the story to what has happened, but investors seem to be numb to the headlines and the tweets and so on. Um, and, and I'd say there's also been some research done to suggest that the quants are to blame a little bit in that um, there are several uh, uh, categories of quantitative strategies that um, follow these trends in markets. Um, and as volatility um, gets reduced, they, they actually lever up those positions. Um, so as long as volatility stays low, they're going to hang on to those positions. So, um, y you know, I wouldn't be completely shocked if what Steve said happens, which is if there is a volatility shock and they need to unwind some of those positions that the move is exacerbated. It hasn't rung true for a long time, but I think there's certainly that risk. Please. Just following up on this, there was a, uh, a well-known investor recently on CNBC that brought up the concept of a plunge protection team. I don't know if you know about this, but, and, um, you know, there is government interference in Japan, China, Europe, Switzerland. So do you guys see any sign of, uh, you know, the, the invisible hand of the government coming in and, you know, smoothing things out? Or there doesn't seem to be, you know, I don't follow this as closely. There doesn't seem much momentum on the downside, no matter what happens. You know, um, do, you, do you see anything? I mean, is that even possible to, that that could be going on? You don't say when I, 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 I know the question. I, have, I don't observe it. Um, Would you be able to tell? I don't know. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. I, mean, I think for, for decades now, we've talked about the Greenspan put or the, the Fed uh, put. And, and yeah, I, I still I do think there's a notion that, that the Fed will come to the rescue um, if, if markets do fall apart. So I don't know if that means as explicit. Yeah, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't know if there's explicit. He was talking about going in and. Fighting. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I. I've seen no evidence of that, and uh, but I do think um, sentiment-wise, and and there certainly is this feeling that the Fed will no longer raise, you know, increase QE. So there's this this notion that um, on the downside, the Fed will will bail out the markets. And, and that may serve the same purpose without actually having to put dollars to work in the market. And I think if that happens, it'll happen a lot faster than it did in, in 07 to 09. I just think that the, the Fed has become more, much more highly attuned, both to market conditions and also economic conditions. And I think that's one of the reasons why the rate rise um, activity has been so slow. It's been much slower than many market pundits predicted. I'm talking about over the last three to four years. And we may wind up only having one in rate increase uh, through the balance of the year rather than the two I think a lot of people are talking about just for that reason. I mean, a lot of the conventional behaviors in the market, you know, if you think about financial conditions, indices, and other things, when the Fed is in a tightening mode, that, would, that traditionally exacerbates financial conditions. And yet it's, reverse, it's working in the, uh, in the reverse right now, uh, both on stock, stock prices, uh, interest rates, Inflation, all those are uh, corporate earnings are all quite favorable to uh, to financial conditions. Even though the Fed's trying to actually lean the other way to cool it down a little bit. Jeff, um, 
there's there's in a there's an article in the Wall Street Journal last week, I believe, that said that assets under management by quant strategies has been going up. What has caused it? Is it purely a performance based uh, reality, or is there something going on as far as what investors want? So uh, I think a, a few different factors. Uh, one is the availability of data and the technology to implement those quantitative strategies. So that's proliferated to become um, lower barriers to entry um, to become a quantitative investor, and therefore there are more of them and, and, and gathering more assets. Um, I think there's also been some good performance. So um, as it happens, and this you know goes way back, is when there's good performance in a particular strategy, uh, assets flow there, um, which is a bit concerning. Uh, I would say, you know, we've lived through a few different periods where quantitative strategies have done uh, fabulously poorly, um, and it's 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 typically been the result of too much leverage, not necessarily too much AUM. So you know, what I keep an eye on is, is you know, what is the amount of leverage in, in competing quantitative strategies and less concerned about the, the, the total level of assets under management because um, it's, still, it's still very small compared to the markets as a whole. It's happened on our platform as well. We've seen in, it's been largely due to not only the performance of our quant team, but also um, uh, customer and client demand. And we actually, 24 months ago, started uh, co-managing. We're based in San Francisco, uh, a quantitative um, real estate product with our quant team here in Boston. And now that fund is partially in, in mutual fund form. That strategy is partially in mutual fund form now. So it's even crept its way in, into our space as well. We, the way it really works is the quant team has their stock selection formula, and then we have the fundamental overlay. So we'll take the second look at the pool of stocks that are selected and then make substitutions where we think uh, we can see better, better alpha creation. Lady in the back. Hi, a number of the panelists today and even you talked a little bit about cybersecurity. And my question really is whether or not you all take into account cybersecurity in terms of measuring company success or performance, either sectors that are more likely to be hacked or large retail companies where consumer confidence might be eroded as a result or even cause an abrupt shift in management change. For example, a panel earlier said that many, I think even you, said that if companies aren't uh, getting up-to-date technology, they're going to fall behind. Are you accounting for that? Where does it start? Well, uh, may I just I'll pick ahead. that off uh, to say that uh, you know, protecting the, the, the moat around around a business and cybersecurity is certainly part of that moat. Uh, we define it even more broadly than that. Uh, I'm going to put it into a very, to a, um, uh, into another phrase called ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance evaluating of companies uh, to make sure they are uh, allowing a sustainable model from every, from every perspective. It's employees, it's clients, the environment, it's governance, and so we hold our, you know, it's an active management um, lever, if you will, uh, that engagement level with companies to make sure, hold them accountable, because if, we believe that ultimately, if they are not performing at a high level relative to their competition in those very measurable uh, categories, and we have, we have subcategories under each of those, uh, it's a precursor, often a precursor, for a company that's either not investing enough into their future and given that stock is the present value of all those future years, uh, that, that it, it, it would be more prone to, uh, to, a, to an issue, whether it be cybersecurity or any other way that they may be underinvesting uh, in their business relative to their peers or relative to, uh, to the industry at, at, uh, uh, in large. Right, and in our process, that's precisely how it's factored in, is through um, ESG <coughs> scores, which isn't a direct uh, look at a firm's cybersecurity defenses, uh, but I think um, gets at management and uh, um, an evaluation of management and assesses uh, you know, the responsibility of management towards protection of customer data. So it, it, it's indirect, 
Uh, but that, at this point, is, is, is how we would incorporate that into our investment process. It's certainly playing a larger role in our fundamental investment process. Well, it's largely in terms of the how we look at it. It's not only the ESG scores in our space, but we spend a lot of time interviewing uh, company management teams, CFOs, chief operating officers, CEOs. We're asking a lot more questions about cybersecurity than we used to. Um, it can take several forms in a public company. It can be revenues being stolen uh, by a hacker. It can also, we even had one instance where uh, a hacker got into a company's email account and started sending out erroneous company press releases that sent the stock down and they had to, it was a huge PR rescue effort. They eventually got it corrected, but there was a lot of volatility what was going on. Can I answer that too? I'll answer it, just one thing. From an academic perspective, um, there's a company I know that gathers information about uh, the likelihood of, of a company uh, being breached, cybersecurity. Okay, so, so given a security uh, an event, um, what's the chances that actually going hackers are going to be able to, to get in? So there's companies that kind of rate uh, companies. And I actually looked at um, a handful of events. Uh, I mean, I don't know, 100, several hundred events of, of attacks, cybersecurity breaches for companies. So I think similar to actually Dan's observation about the anomalous, you know, how on the market is not responding for the, you know, to the to the geopolitics. I mean, here, I can tell that on average, when there's an announcement of a security breach, uh, you know, cybersecurity breach of a company, on average, the market does not respond to it. On average, on average. Right. So to me, it's a, it's puzzling that that investors are just not pricing, uh, you know, these kind of attacks. So I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe maybe it's not costly enough, but but. Uh, it, it's uh, surprising to me that the market is not responding. Please. Follow up question. You mentioned before you keep track of information on leveraging the market. How do you do that? Um, it, so it's uh, informal, um, but uh, mostly focus on prime brokerage information as well as uh, brokerage um, information on uh, leverage within those strategies. So it's, it's generally survey based. I believe you mentioned that uh, you follow the, the leverage ratios in the, in the industry as to s some of the impact on the potential risk to the industry. I is there anything about how people are getting their equity exposure that's affecting the capital markets and their operations, <coughs> especially in the equity markets, meaning you know people are coming into ETFs, they're not necessarily holding that basket of securities, they're, they're, holding, they're holding derivatives and other things that mm -hmm. replicate that basket of security. When the next shock happens or the next wave, is that of concern to you at all? So I certainly think ETFs have changed the dynamics of the market, um, uh, especially as compared to mutual funds. So as we know, mutual funds, you can trade them once a day and it's at four o'clock and um, you know all the, the order flow for those transactions are around a single point in time where there happens to be quite a bit of liquidity. Um, ETFs, um, as we know, throughout the day they can be traded and you're trading with a market maker who may or may not be there. I'd say in large part the market has worked. I think we had a, an issue uh, within the past couple of years on some fixed income ETFs where the market didn't work as well as people anticipated and there's actually been some rule changes as a result um, to, to, to try to solve for that. So, you know, I think the, the concern over ETFs being the next financial crisis I think is a bit overblown. I would say that the movement towards passive investing versus active investing has, has changed quite a bit where the volume in the market is. So, so as opposed to it being at the single stock level, um, it, it's at the ETF level or the future mm -hmm. level or the fund level. And I, I think that is, is having an impact on single stock liquidity. Um, and as an example, an active fund may have turnover of 100% a year <laughs> as their ideas shift and risks in the market shift, whereas a passive fund um, may only have 5% turnover in a year. So you can imagine as, as passive funds grow in share of the overall market, the level of turnover on those individual stocks is going to come down quite a bit. We worry about it a little bit. Uh, the, the, by and large, in the REIT space, most of the index funds, there are no leverage and there are no leverage in our funds. But there are a handful of levered long and short ETFs in the space. We worry about it more reputationally because the performance has generally been terrible. Th those types of funds tend to either buy or sell at the wrong time with the levered funds. 
um, uh, selling down as, as the stock moves down instead of covering a short, for example, if it's a short fund or the other way around, it, it, if a, a levered long fund has to sell to cover a margin call, they really should be buying the stock lower you know, if it has positive fundamentals than the other way around. And so we worry about that reputationally hurting our sector that an investor thinks that they're, be, they're investing in the REIT space and they've got this horrible product that it, it rubs off on the rest of the sector. But m most of the, the leverage that we analyze is at the company level um, as opposed to uh, among individual investors. Black Swan events, how much should an individual investor worry about them? How much do you guys worry about them? Pandemic, something like that. Mm -hmm. We worry about them. It's very hard to manage for them, however, because you know the probability is, uh, as defined by their name, is very small. Um, so to to manage for them is is very difficult. We do employ some tail hedging strategies, um, and I'd say the difficulty in those strategies is going through the period like we've had over the past decade, where they are simply you know you've bought insurance and you've paid the premiums and it hasn't paid off. Um, and so I think behaviorally, it's very hard to hang on to that um, investment long enough for it to pay off. Uh, so, so in, in, in our, it's sort of my investment um, approach uh, to solve for that, we just try to keep it small enough so that we can suffer the pain of paying the insurance every year. Um, and therefore, we can hold it through long periods of time without uh, it, it paying off. For an individual investor, I think it's really hard to do that. Um. It's an ongoing risk in, across capital markets and, and in our space. There's a few things that we do. We're long only and we're not levered. But in, in, when we believe that there's more risk in our dedicated market, we'll typically migrate the portfolio to the highest quality stocks and, and oftentimes hold a little more cash than we normally do. Um, the more important thing, I think, at least in our space, is how we behave and the actions that we take once that event happens. Because there actually are a lot of opportunities that present themselves, but you have to be disciplined enough to be maybe exiting stocks at a loss and migrating into other stocks that you think are going to outperform as the facts have changed, and sometimes they change very quickly. We have time for maybe one more question. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Well done, guys. Thank you.